Our podcast is brought to you by Northern Bee Books, stockist of the largest range of new and second-hand bee books. Specialist publishers including the Beekeepers Quarterly and Natural Bee Husbandry magazine. Check them out at northernbeebooks.co.uk. Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. This is episode 157 of our beekeeping show, banned in the EU but still sold in New Zealand. We are Gary and Margaret. We are Kiwi Mana, and Kiwi Mana are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges on the wild west coast of Auckland in the North Island of New Zealand. Yes, we build and sell beekeeping equipment and bees provide beekeeper services and education. This week we ask why the EU is banning pesticides and what are some great plants that help bumblebees. We have roving reporters checking in from Scotland, England, Australia and the United States of America. And the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash 157. Awesome. So what's happening with our bees? Let's talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) So what's happening with our bees at Kiwi Mana, Margaret? Well, over the last two months, I've been conducting some field trials in our apiary. You will be surprised to hear this, Gary. What are you working on? Well, most of our audience know that we have always used plant-based concentrates to treat Varroa. We use the Apilifar, which is a wafer infused with thyme, camphor, eucalyptus and menthol oils. And that's one of the organic treatments we use. And the other one we use is oxalic acid crystals in conjunction with our kiwi vaporizing tool. So this summer, I wanted to find out how the colonies would cope with less treating. So how many treatments were you doing before you started this test? I was doing one treatment of oxalic acid vaporization per fortnight. That's every two weeks with a full head of oxalic acid crystals. And what have you been doing recently then? I treated the first month of summer, but then I haven't treated for the last two months at all. Ooh. More details, please, Margaret. Well, I think the the scenario is is that we don't want to use synthetic Varroa miticide treatments due to the resistance factor. And... They are causing it, and there's there's absolutely proof there's resistance in the Varroa mite, and that's based from the research that we have read and also what we have seen the bees experience over the last five years. So it is as if the Varroa are even stronger now than even 10 years ago. So we had to change our oxalic acid vaporization treatment methods. For example, the regularity and amount of crystals we used. Okay, so what what was it working? Yes, we have been, the last two winters, we have had colonies that got through autumn, survived winter, and that was 100%, and that's, I think, the last four winters. The failures which we did get were after the official calendar, so start of spring or end of autumn. So through winter itself, we treated through and we were doing uh, the treatments, the oxalic acid, every fortnight. Okay, so why have you decided to do this change? I guess I would like to stop treating as often. Principally, the aim was to keep knocking back Varroa, so this would stop build up in the cells. In the meantime, the hope is that the bees would be able to cope with the presence of some mites and therefore in time they would be able to deal with Varroa on their own. So that has been my goal. Okay, so what, what's the result been like and have you had any problems and have you done any like mite counts? Um, so far, there has been seen in some colonies some deformed wing bees, but very few. And the populations inside each hive is consistently high and very active. And have you, what sort of mite counting have you been doing? I haven't done mite counts. <gasps> okay. I've been looking at the inspection boards and just been very casual about it this year. I really wanted to see how far I could push what I'm doing. Well, the inspection boards is a mite count, isn't it? So what, what, what's that showing you? 
you know what it's showing me? It's showing me that there are huge amounts of pollen mites this season. It's like I had one customer come and talk to me. He said, I've seen all this brownie stuff on the inspection boards. And I thought, well, that sounds a bit like what I'm experiencing. So I said to him, I think it's pollen mites. And I just even went out today and had a look at the boards, the inspection boards underneath. And they had pollen mites. So the bees are definitely doing a lot of hygiene behavior, getting rid of them, I reckon. But it's been so hot for so long and so dry, there's just heaps of them. And I'm talking thousands. Are they on the inspection boards? Yeah. To be honest, very few Varroa. So what's the next step then? I will need your help to conduct full end of season inspections on each of our colonies. Yes, absolutely. When will you need me to help you? You heard it, folks. He's asked, okay, the purpose of these full assessment inspections will be to start preparing for winter or commonly called wintering down. Also to do varroa mite level checks, check bee shape, queen rightedness and honey levels, which mean may mean we can extract some. So we, I've been very slow on all of that this year and because of my Back issues I have struggled. So once these are completed, we'll update everyone. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see what we find. The other things we're doing is the wintering down is gonna involve the robbing screens at the moment. We're pulling all the robbing screens down because we've had temperatures of single digits. So as we start to get single digits coming into autumn, when we get them for longer than a week or two weeks, depending on your area, then bring your robbing screens down. If you've got wasp presence, you should bring the robbing screens down and just put a smaller access on. Um, but at the moment, the populations are pretty busy. And during the day, we've had quite hot temperatures. So and slowly we're doing the wintering down process. Robbing screens first, full assessment. Uh, we'll look at a treatment cycle of oxalic acid and see where that goes. Yes, indeed. So it's officially autumn, isn't it, now on the, on the calendar? It is, it is getting colder, eh? Oh, yeah, definitely tonight, ma'am. I thought I might put my socks on because it's a bit cool. <laughs> yes, and it's spring for our overseas beekeepers. But let's hear about the end of the winter updates from around the world with Rovering Reporters. <laughs> This week we hear from Dunblane, Hampshire, New York and Victor Harbour. Yes, we hear from Calvin in Dunblane, Scotland. Calvin is an advanced bee master beekeeper. He teaches beginner beekeepers in honey bee biology to his local association. His main interest isn't in honey, but queen rearing and breeding to improve his stock of bees. Awesome! Let's hear from Calvin. Hi Gary and Margaret, it's Kelvin here from a very windy and stormy Dunblane here in Scotland. Um, slightly delayed with my um, report this week because unfortunately I had to um, attend my mother's funeral last Monday down in London and uh, we've had quite a lot of disruptive weather here in the UK so it's quite difficult to get down. But anyway, so at the moment we're in the middle of Storm Dennis. We had Storm Kira last week, Storm Dennis, um, lots of um, stuff on my Twitter feed about Beekeepers down south, uh, their bees have been lost their bees because basically rivers have uh, burst their banks. And unfortunately, the poor, poor hives have been um, overwhelmed by water. You can only see what's going to happen in the future um, when, the, when the waters subside. So a big shout out to my fellow beekeepers down in Yorkshire and down in, in Wales, which seem to have been um, affected quite badly by the weather um, over the last couple of days. In other news, Scottish Beekeeping Association runs a modular um, examination system and I run a study group because I've passed all the modules myself. So I run a study group for about eight to ten beekeepers from my local association, which is the Dunblane and Stirling Beekeepers Association. And we're now currently on module six, which is honeybee behaviour, which is quite interesting. I've also been busy in my garage. I run out of eeks. Uh, these are small kind of lifts that we put on top of um, crown boards just to keep the roofs off of any fondant that we may put on the bees as we're feeding. 
I'm no handyman, but um, actually they didn't turn out too badly. It's a shame that I can't take pictures and attach them to this um, this message as well. As I say, weather's really bad at the moment, but spring should be just around the corner, hopefully. Um, the whole reports the bees have been flying. We, we have had a little occasional day where it's been quite warm and bees have been flying. But that's me. That's my two minutes up. Guys, thank you once again for inviting me to do this. Um, and once again, I apologise that it's a bit late, but circumstances beyond my control. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Gary. Cheers now. Bye bye. Cheers, Calvin. And yeah, that was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, well, first up, sorry to hear about your mother. And don't worry about the uh, being delayed with the report because it's all good. It's all good. And, and we're a bit late too. And so, but the bees are still doing their thing. And it's so good to get your update. And we appreciate that very much, Calvin. Yeah, it's sad about the rivers and storms, eh? Oh, yeah, it's been a, well, it's been a bit of a rock and roll ride, hasn't it? I'm not really sure to eek. I think it's like a, a space array. Yeah, I mean, we'd love to get the photos and we could always pop them into a blog if you wanted to send them in, Calvin. That would be awesome. And congrats on getting to the next part of your studies. Absolutely. And I, we heard a sneeze in the background. I hope that's nothing serious. Yes, there's a few issues about that around the world. But let's move on, Gary. Okay. Okay, next we hear from Chris in Hampshire in England. And Chris is a beekeeper and vet from Three Hairs Honey in rural Hampshire. And for the most exceptional raw honey from rural Hampshire, check out his website, threehairshoney.com. And Chris, thanks, Chris, for supporting Kiwi Mana. Absolutely. Uh, what's Chris been up to? Hello, Gary and Margaret and Kiwi Mana friends from around the world. It's Chris Palgrave here from Three Hairs Honey in Hampshire in southern England. Well, to be honest, it's been pretty quiet on the bee front. I've been looking out of the window at the beautiful sunshine during the week. But come the weekend, it's pouring with rain and I can't get anything done. We had Storm Kiara, then Storm Dennis, and I believe we've got Storm Ellen this weekend. So all that boiling up of old frames and re-waxing them ready for next season is going to have to wait again. There have been some advantages to being cooped up indoors, though. I've managed to get a bit of writing done. I've put together a short blog for the British Veterinary Association, and I've also written an article for Beecraft magazine, which is a magazine here in the UK. We also have the British Bee Veterinary Association meeting coming up at the beginning of April. I'm going to be giving a talk on European fowl broods, so there's plenty to keep me out of trouble. I'm particularly excited about that meeting because the keynote speaker will be Nicolas vidal Nacque. He's a French bee vet who wrote the textbook Honey Bee Veterinary Medicine, which I'm sure some of you will have seen or at least heard of. Of course, since we last spoke, the UK is no longer part of the EU, which for a significant number of us is a great sadness. However, we still do feel very much part of that European beekeeping family. In fact, I've been trying to rekindle something of the pen pal era by making friends with beekeepers from different European countries. One of those is Marlene Ratgeber, who lives in Paderborn in northwest Germany. I think her surname is particularly appropriate because it means giver of advice, which I think we could all do with from time to time. Marlene's beekeeping business is called Die Wabenwerke, which I particularly like as it means the honeycomb workers or perhaps honeycomb operators, which can be applied equally to the bees inside the hive as to us mere beekeepers outside it. I'd encourage you to take a look at her website and social media and see what she gets up to. Well, I think I'm out of time and that's all my news for now. So I'll say goodbye and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Wow, Chris um, is very busy at the moment. So uh... Yeah, it's really good to get all these cross contacts, eh? Cross pollinations. Yes, around, around the world. Yeah. I mean, this weekend I'm interviewing Michael Jordan from Cheyenne, so I'm trying to get trying to get in touch with these beekeepers around the world for you guys. Absolutely, that's awesome. So you know, it's always good to hear how everyone's going, and yeah, as we've moved along a bit further, it'll be interesting to see what's happening with for them all um, as they come into a bit more of the season. Yeah, I mean, it's been terrible weather in England, but it's, but it's been amazing weather here, so it's not good. But it's it had, it had a bit of rain, haven't we, since the last podcast? Yeah, we got a bit of water in the tank, so that was always um, very welcomed. But yeah, it's been very dry. It's settled down a bit, eh, and the temperatures with them cooling off means that yeah, the bees are still hanging out on the landing boards and lots of pollen actually coming in at the moment. So it looks like they've shifted from nectar to pollen collection now so but yeah it's, it's been pretty awesome well now we're going to move across the atlantic to new york 
or Suffolk County, and from Walter, who's been keeping bees in the West Hills of New York for over three years. And Walter is studying to become a master beekeeper, and I love this accent. It's awesome. Let's hear from Walter. Hello, Gary and Margaret. This is Walter Scott with Scott's Apiary and Farm. Today is Tuesday, February 11th, and we have a temperature of 45 degrees Fahrenheit. However, we have been getting quite a bit of rain, and that's what we're anticipating for the remainder of the week. Out in the bee yard, what we've been doing is checking on food stores by way of doing a heft test by lifting uh, the back of the hive up and checking to see that there's sufficient weight to the hive. If the hive is light, we are making note of it, and on a good warm day where the temperatures are between 50 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit, we will go in and feed them sugar cakes and winter patties to keep them going until there's pollen and nectar in the environment for them to forage on, but that's quite a bit of time from now. We're also thinking about our Varroa mite treatments. If we do get a good day, we'll probably go out there and do an oxalic acid dribble or vapor. As far as the beekeeper activity, what we've been doing is building new boxes. We've got some nukes that we're going to be looking to prep up in the spring, probably around May or June. And we are building new 10 frame brood boxes. We're attending uh, bee meetings, and we're reading a couple of good books as uh, to keep us occupied over the winter until we get into spring where we'll be actually physically working with the bees. Till the next uh, report, we wish you well and take care. Oh, wonderful, Walter. And uh, yes, both Walter and his wife sell honey at their local fair, so have a look at that, guys, and get yourself some yummy local honey. Yeah, and it's good to, good winter's a great time to be building boxes and getting ready for the new season, eh? Oh, yeah, it's actually opportune time, isn't it? And also you can also um, go and read. Yes, absolutely. uh, We're we're, going to hear about some bee books later on, aren't we? Absolutely. And, um, yeah, it's everyone's coming towards spring in a stronger way now, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, I'm just so excited to hear the next updates. And uh, good luck with all the nukes, Walter. Yes, and it's a, uh, Walter raised a great point. Is spring is a good time to check the stores. And the heft test means you like lift the back of the hive to see how heavy it is and to see if you need to feed the bees. Uh, because spring often is when bees starve, eh? Yeah, starvation is something to really be aware of. And especially if you get a sudden burst of warm weather, the bees did that this season for us, eh, in spring. And they suddenly started changing the laying and the population was getting so big. But then we had a big cold drop in temperature and then the bees were, there was heaps of bees but there wasn't enough food left. So yeah, luckily I caught it in time and uh, managed to save them. So yes, I think you're absolutely right, Gary. This time of the year you have to be aware of what their food stores are. Absolutely. Now we're going to head a bit closer to home. We're heading to Victor Harbour in Australia and we hear from Dan. Dan, with the amazing help of his lovely wife Tracy and daughter Ivy, is a keeper of the bees and chickens. Chickens. (laughs) Follow Dan and Tracy's adventures on the Instagrams at geocache and bees. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Dan and Tracy, for being supporters of the Kiwi Mana. Buzz. Buzz. Okay. Okay. Quite it. Quite it. Okay. I was told the other day that I'm the serious one and you're the Joker one. <laughs> it was in a, in a podcast called The Might Bomb Podcast, wasn't it? Really? Yes. Funny. Oh, okay. We, we, we were talked about on that podcast. I don't know if it was good or bad. Oh, did you not listen? I did. Oh, I want to hear about that. <laughs> Okay, we'll talk let's about do it. Later. Okay, let's hear from Dan. G'day, Gary and Margaret and the rest of the Kiwi Mana listeners. It's uh, Dan from Victor Harbour in South Australia. Well, it's been another pretty harsh summer in our part of the world. We've been reasonably fortunate where we are. There were some very bad fires about 50 kilometres away from us on Kangaroo Island. Obviously, because that's an island, the fires themselves didn't threaten our part of the world, but 
a lot of uh, devastation. And of course, there on Kangaroo Island, they have a lot of very rare uh, bee species. So people uh, over there are still trying to work out what they've got left from the fires and uh, they're getting quite a bit of community assistance as well. Bees in our backyard, um, they definitely were affected by the smoke. Even now, just a few weeks later, we're still getting the occasional day where it's quite smoky and hazy and you notice that they're um, slowing down and struggling a little bit. But on the other days, they've been quite busy. And in fact, we even harvested some honey a few weeks ago, got some beautiful honey from our second hive. Very fortunately, just metres away from the hive, there's some big, tall eucalyptus trees and they had some beautiful gum flowers on them. So it seemed like the bees were going straight to that. So they actually filled the frames up pretty quickly. And so we took our first proper harvest from them. Uh, We had taken some comb before, but just to get a bit of a taste. So that's been nice. We've been giving that to family and friends and enjoying showing them around some of the beehives as well. Well, we're hoping now that um, the weather stabilised. We had a lot of heavy rain right across Australia and some of those fires have been going for months and they've finally been extinguished. So hopefully um, the rest of the east coast of Australia, things will settle now and we look forward to hearing more from the Kiwi Mana listeners from right around the world. Awesome, Dan. And um, yes, I think that these fires, they even affected us. Eh? We had some real weird weather. And like during the day, the bees all got confused. eh? There was like this big smoke cloud that came over and everything looked sort of orange, didn't it? It was was freaky. Yeah, and it's great to hear. It's great to hear all the fires are out now because I heard the other day that all the fires in New South Wales are out. Yeah, we got something on the Facebook which um, said that the fires were all out now. So we're very happy. But now it's all about rebuilding, isn't it? And And like Dan was saying, is that they don't really know how much devastation has been caused and what survived. So this is going to be an ongoing process for them. And uh, yeah, we're thinking of you and Aussie. And Dan, that was great. You got a bit of honey off and yeah, awesome. Absolutely. And I wonder if the smoke's going to affect the taste of the honey at all. Hopefully not, eh? Well, you could call it the 2020 smoke honey. (laughs) <laughs> you could. Smoked honey. Smoked honey. That would be interesting. Yeah, maybe, maybe Dan can tell us on his next report. Yeah, we look forward to that and we hope that Tracy and Ivy are doing okay and all ready to go for, yeah, the end of season. Okay, this week in Bee Books, we catch up with Jerry Burbridge from Northern Bee Books about a great Bee Book of the Week. Jerry, what have you found for us this week? The one I'd recommend is Honey Bee Drones, a book by Graham Kingham. It concentrates totally on the drone, the male honeybee. It provides details regarding the drone's internal, external anatomy, production and development, behavior, role in the hive, genetics and more. It's copiously illustrated and the book discusses the latest updates on drones. If you want good honey crops, You've got to make sure that you control your drones. It's available from Northern Bee Books. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Because, I mean, Northern, um, the drones are normally seen as the bad person in the hive, aren't they, or the lazy bee? Absolutely. It's not certainly. I mean, if you're into breeding bees, you want to flood the area with your drones with the characteristics that you want. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thanks, Jerry, for telling us about that. And as Jerry said, that's available from Northern Bee Books or Amazon. And I think it's quite an interesting subject because drones, people often ask me about drones and to be honest, I don't really know what their job is. So a book like this would definitely help to understand some of the things that they've discovered. Absolutely. I can Now I know what to get you for, for Christmas. Oh, yes. Beekeeping news, news you can use. Yes, with lots of views from all of yous as well. Entire European Union bans a Bayer insecticide. (laughs) Okay, despite the EU planning to ban... (laughs) No bias here. ...bioclopirid, which is the active ingredient of Calypso, 
It's still used in New Zealand on apples, avocados, kiwi fruit, and peaches. Why? Mm. Why, we ask? Yes, indeed. And quoting from the article, in October of last year, a European Union Commission recommended that the EU not renew authorization for the use of phyocloprid, an insecticide made by Bayer. This week, the EU officially declined to renew approval, which is the way the EU bans things. They simply declined to make them legal to use. Yeah, that's an interesting tactic. And a lot of them, you know, when you look at in the pharmaceutical industry and things like that, they often just approve something. But even if it's had a change, because the thing that's being voted for is actually a change to that thing, but because it exists as one thing and they slightly change it, they can say, nah, we're not going to go ahead with it. So it's a good point, and I, I'm, I'm pleased they made that decision. Yes, indeed, and the, the EU members have got till August the 3rd to withdraw the authorisation of the product, and the grace period may extend up to February 2021. Interesting. Give the uh, farmers some time to find alternatives, I guess. Yes, and unfortunately, this Bayer produced neonicotinoid is still sold right here in clean green New Zealand. It's not that clean, is it here? All green. I mean it's green, but it's there's a lot of there's a lot of pesticides in New Zealand, isn't there? Yeah, I think once you start, you know, drilling down the exact exact land management practices, which I always love to rave about because we do need to get some, you know, real open communication and, and declarations from you know, food producers, what they're putting in on the food that they're actually growing. You know, they say you want to put ingredients on stuff, but where is the ingredients come from? What land management practices did they use? That kind of thing. So I think that they, that this is probably another one that needs to be uh, looked at. They did a study in January 2019. This, that was the safety of Phyochloprid and when there are effects on bees, so they decided to completely prohibit its use. Wow. It was banned due to concerns over its role in bee deaths, water contamination, and human health. Well, good on you, EU. Yeah, we're, we're proud of you. It's a big decision, but I think we have to start saying no. Just say no. Yes, and we have our thoughts are with you guys at the moment with this uh, coronavirus. COVID-19, they've named it, and uh, yes, we're thinking of everybody all over the world. And just stay calm, you know? Just don't don't make panic decisions when you don't have to, okay? Anyway, back here. What, what feedback did we get, Gary? We heard from Helen Patricia Smith, and she says, great, long overdue. Amen. And Donna says, such exciting news. Indeed. And John Thompson says, now tell me what the outcome was as to prerogativity. Well, we don't know yet because it's still been used, isn't it? Yes, that's right. The research that I'm reading at the moment is concerns about the combinational effect of synthetic chemicals for not only our bees, but for the human population in our food chain. And these concerns have been written and discussed since the 1950s. Because after the Second World War, there was so much chemical production and all sorts of things going on. And uh, unfortunately, you know, books like Rachel Carson, you know, she, author and scientist, she writes about the combination of these things. So on the face of it, one thing may not do anything, but together it's really destroying the gut of the bee. So I'm, I presume it's affecting a lot of other insects as well. So, Yeah, I, I listened yeah. to a, a podcast the other day with an interview with a scientist, and they are doing a lot of those combinational effect studies now too. So, so that's good news, eh? Yeah, I think it's really necessary because it's, you know, they say that, the, that when you get these chemicals, they're actually... It's not the blood system of the bee that it's affecting. It's actually the fats in the digestive part of the abdomen. So that's a very big concern. And that's why oxalic acid dribble is not a very effective treatment because the bees eat the oxalic acid, which is a concentrate, and that's not good for bees. I think it's an effective treatment, but it's just not good for the bees, is it? In actual fact, if it's not good for the bees, how can it be a good treatment? Well, true. Good point. Anyway, that's, um, yeah, 
That's my view on that, as I always have one. <laughs> well, of course. Okay, of course you so, always have a view. Of course, and so do you. So we're all we're all up for cleaning up the world and trying to look after her a lot better. Yes, before she throws us all off. Yeah, it does. <laughs> She's trying to do it at the moment, drowning us, making us too cold, making it too hot. <laughs> oh, yeah, She's oh. definitely angry. Angry. Okay, next story. Let's move on. Bumblebees' favourite flowers identified to aid bee restoration. An article from Sky Tech Daily investigates what flowers can help restore bumblebee populations. That's right. Many species of the North American bumblebees have been have been in significant declines in the recent decades. Bumblebees are essential pollinators for native and agricultural plants, and their ability to fly in colder temperatures make them especially important pollinators at high elevations. Bumblebee declines have been attributed to a handful of factors, including lack of flowers, and not all flowers are used equally by bumblebees. Interesting, and the things that really come to my view is that, oh, Snow's got a few views in the background over there. Anyway, the study was published in the Environmental Entomology Journal. Yeah, there's a full study there that you actually need to pay for to get access, which is fine because, you know, people have to get paid to eat, don't they? Indeed, and I think that if you need to get the details, because I couldn't find the list... No, but I did extract the favourite plants of two of the bees. Uh, one was Bombus bifurus, sometimes known as the two-form bumblebee. Uh, preferred selected thick-stem aster flowers. And there's a Latin word there, which I, I won't even try to really name. Eurobea intergrifolia. Bombus bifurus inhabits mountainous regions of western North America. And the next one was the black tail bumblebee, Bombus melanophus. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, guys. That's how I say it. <laughs> Prefers selected Ryberg's penistra. <laughs> you say it. Okay. The black tail bumblebee, Bombus melanophagus, prefers selected Ryberg's penstemon flowers, penstemon Rybergi. And we've got a link there to Wikipedia which shows that one. And Bombus melanopagus, it's native to Western North America from British Columbia to California and as far east as Idaho. Wow, that's fantastic. Is Bombus melanophagus, is that related to the, uh, the the character in Sesame Street? You know, the melanophagus? <laughs> Absolutely, Gary. Absolutely. <laughs> I thought so. If it is that way for you, then yes, it is. <laughs> I need to get lessons in Latin. Anyway, in the New Zealand, the most common bumblebee is Bombus terrestris. Terrestris. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that was a good article. And if you want to plant those plants, well done for you for identifying them, Gary. That's well done. If you want to encourage bumblebees... You can get these, but you could also get the New Zealand purple hebe because that one went crazy this um, summer, didn't it? It did. Is that the one by the water tank? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, that was awesome. If you want to encourage bumblebees, plant these trees. Any feedback? Yep, we've got Jackie Davidson exasperating that they don't name the 14 best species. Just talk around it. Yeah, that frustrated me too, Jackie, and I think that if you want more details, we'll have to buy the full story or sign up to the Oxford Academy. That's right, because people have to get money to do this these kind of studies, don't they? Yeah, so, and if they do all this work, I think that it might not be too expensive to get it done, so, yeah, anyway, that's really up to you guys, but that was, yeah, I'm, I think it was a valuable study. Well, update from us. We have some good news and sad news. Over the last few months, we've tried to see if Kiwi Mana could earn us a living, but after much research and discussion, the, the money just wasn't coming in, eh? So Gary has gone back to the corporate world. And he's so excited about that, guys. But the worst, <laughs> I am. the worst thing about it is that the accountant that we spoke to told me that 
my beekeeping work was just a hobby. <laughs> now, yes. you could imagine what was going on in my head. Yes, I know. Okay, but, you know, so we're looking at the best way to use our limited free time going forward. And uh, here yeah, we're wondering about the future of the podcasts. So if you care about the show and, you know, you love it and you get something of value and it helps you, please email us one thing that you get out of the show to info at kiwimana.co.nz. Yeah, that'd be great to hear if uh, if you're out there listening because we, uh, we sometimes hear from people, eh, but not often. But yes, now that you say that, Gary, we did hear from Rachel Stone who is from Perth. Oh, I love this I love this letter. Do you want to read it, Dale? Yes, well, she writes, Hi guys, I work from my car and had a two day round trip of seven to eight thousand eight no seven to eight hundred kilometers on Thursday and Friday and binge listen to your podcast. It is great. That's in capital letters and two exclamation marks. That's because she's shouting it. <laughs> Yay! In a language and accent I can understand, coming from Christchurch originally, but now living in Perth. Oh, that's fantastic. No awesome, translations needed. Awesome. I picked up my first nuke yesterday and made my first rookie mistake. Enjoy the photos. They were funny, weren't they? <laughs> I won't show those photos, Rachel. We'll just keep those between us. Because they, <laughs> they were. Anyway, she's, she got stung on the face, which is very embarrassing. Since the guy kept emphasising that I had to let them out as soon as I got home, I did, but one to two video it for the friend who had given me the flow hive. Yeah, I was I was leaving for about t- 10 minutes when I get home, because eh, they're always a bit rustled up. Oh, no, I, I think that opening them up is a, is a good idea, but don't have a torch, keep yourself covered. <laughs> and a camera, yeah. wear a veil. I mean, it might have been during the day, so they might have been pretty hot. I don't even know what time she was... Um, doing the opening and, and when she moved them. so Yes, indeed. So, so yeah, she yeah. just goes on to say, Rookie Mistake 101, standing in front of the hive in the flight path videoing. <laughs> yes, man. <laughs> Absolutely. And she's very excited about the whole idea and venture. So thank you for your enthusiasm and encouragement to people like me. Oh, that's really great, eh? And she also mentioned that She's going to read the girl next door's list of 10 rookie mistakes. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. And she also went to the local bee club and a few of the presenters were a tad pessimistic and condescending. So it might stick working my way through your resources where all the positive people have shared their knowledge to encourage us backyarders to get into the game. Amen. And that is awesome. And unfortunately, that does happen. You know, but you got Aussie guys have got a few different challenges than us. Yeah, they probably have those strong views for a reason. So I'd listen to hear them out. But you, you know, we we learn from everybody all around. But I I just don't like the the condescending side of things. You know, no, not not at all. We Terrible. don't need that. Well, thanks, Rachel, for your comments and thanks for supporting us. It's fantastic and we really appreciate yeah. you getting in touch with us because it really lifts, it lifts us up, doesn't it, Dale? It does. It, it makes it worthwhile. So thank you very much, Rachel, for taking time to update us with your new adventures. Okay, who helped us bring the show to you? Thanks for listening to our show and thanks to all our supporters who support us through the Patreon service. This week we would like to thank Tim Wilcox Mandy Shaw from the Beekeeper Confidential Podcast Dan McGiven Greg Parr from Parr's Products Parr's.co.nz Jim Munn Rosewarn Glenn Gothorpe Christopher Brown from Brit Marner. Hope you're all doing well over there. Absolutely. John Pear from tuliptreehoney.com. Hey, John. Lisa Morrissey. Yeah, Lisa. Chris Palgraves from threeheareshoney.com. Phil Takoyaki. Irene Townsend. Gutney Hunter. Robin O'Connell. Tony Lum and Hazel Two. Carolyn Sloan. Boris Brockman. Rachel Stone. Notice Rachel. Anyway, Lucy. Nathan Buzzinger Beekeeping from Buzzinger Beekeeping. Trish Stretton, currently studying mycelin. Mycelium. 
mycelium. Check out highfade.nz. Scott Wilshire. Michelle Seidler from SeidlerRanch.com. Buzz Honeys, humane bee relocation from Buzz Honeys. And Finn's Bees. Thanks to you all. Awesome. Just want to put a separate shout out there to Trish Stretton for her support over the last few years. And know we wish you all the best in your next endeavours. If you love what we do and find it useful, you can support us too. Visit kiwi.bz slash banana. And big shout out to our new supporters. Huge thanks to Lucy, who started supporting what we do in February. Thanks, Lucy. Yes, and thanks again to Rachel Stone for also becoming a supporter this month. And thanks for sharing your great story. And Justin, this week, thanks to Ulrika Malberg for becoming a new supporter. Thanks so much. Fantastic, Ulrika. Awesomeness, banana. And the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash 157. Absolutely. And it's been a bit slow to get going, but it's on its way and we hope you love it. And look forward to hearing from everyone next time, eh, Dal? That's right. So thanks for listening. We appreciate you joining us this week. We know life is crazy, so we appreciate you spending a little time with us. Absolutely. And thank you so much.